Good morning and welcome. My name is Zante Glavas, and Professor Rourke has asked me to see a few introductory remarks. So I want to welcome um, Mark Gunther. Mark, he's back there. Come on. So Mark is our speaker here. As you know, it's 10 years since. He comes from Bethesda, Maryland, and personally, it is great to have him here. He's a very influential speaker who has uncovered stories in Fortune Magazine, GreenBiz.com, and wrote a lot of books. So Mark, it is a true honor to have you here. You've been a big influence in my life, and thank you for coming here. Great. Thank you, Andre. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming. The, uh, the title of the lecture series is 10 Years Hence, but I'm going to start by asking a question that looks backward. And the question is this. Are we turned on? No. So I'm going to start by asking a question that looks backwards, and the question is this. What has the impact of business been on society? Is business more ethical than it used to be? Is it making more of a positive contribution than it used to be or not? Looking back, let's say, 10 years. And, and it would easy, be easy to be cynical about this question because we are not that far away from the accounting scandals of, say, 10 years ago when we had Enron and WorldCom and Tyco going bust. Uh, we, of course, had the financial crisis of 2008 for which there were a lot of causes, but part of it was clearly irresponsibility on the part of the uh, big banks and mortgage industry that caused the housing meltdown. Uh, and in the area that I cover, which is energy and the environment, uh, just in the last year, we've seen that terrible uh, massy coal accident in West Virginia. Uh, we had the BP uh, oil spill. And most recently, we've had the problems with the nuclear plants in Japan. So while it would be easy to be cynical or easy to be negative, I want to try to persuade you this morning that, in fact, uh, business is changing for the better, and dramatically so. And this is one of the uh, big trends we've seen in corporate America in the last 10 years. So I'll do it by telling stories, because that's what I do for a living. And I want to talk about three companies to begin with, uh, Nike, McDonald's, and Dell, and ask you to think about what they might have in common. Do you remember about 15 years ago, uh, it was discovered that Nike was making their uh, clothing and sports equipment in conditions in places like China and India. Of course, most of you are so young, you don't remember anything from 15 years ago, but you probably read about the fact that there were problems in Nike's supply chain. Uh, they were using child labor. The working conditions were unsafe, uh, et cetera. And the first response from Phil Knight, who is the CEO of Nike, was essentially to say, this is not my problem. These people don't work for me. Uh, they're on the other side of the world. These are our suppliers. We can't take responsibility for that. But that message didn't work. And uh, under pressure, Nike began to say, OK, we will monitor the conditions in our supply chain. And today, Nike has a very expensive and very extensive system of hiring factory monitors who travel around the world to all the places where its products are made. Uh, trying to ensure that they're made under conditions that those of us in the West would feel OK about. And it's not just Nike. It's Gap and Timberland and Walmart. And all the brands are now saying, uh, we are going to make sure human rights exist in our supply chain. So about five years ago, someone, or collectively a group of people, decided that McDonald's was in some way to blame for the fact that we have an obesity crisis in America. Uh, why they picked McDonald's rather than Ben and Jerry's or Burger King, um, I don't know. But there was the movie Super Size Me. There was a book called Fast Food Nation. And the argument essentially was that McDonald's was selling foods that were making us sick. Now again, this is really a matter, I think, of personal responsibility, not corporate responsibility. Um, the obesity problem is largely caused by the fact we tend to be eating too much and not exercising enough. But rather than ignore the criticism, uh, McDonald's changed the way it does business. It offered uh, healthier choices in the restaurants. It was very transparent um, about its ingredients. It downsized some of its portions. 
Uh, it even went to the extent at some point of handing out um, pedometers that you could click to your, to your waist to encourage you to exercise more and uh, DVDs teaching people how to do yoga. And, and led me to think, you know, what would, what would Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's in the 1950s, uh, have thought if he could come back and see McDonald's serving Asian salads and handing out yoga CDs? And I think he would have thought the world has changed a lot, and yes, it has. So Dell, some years ago, uh, it's not a good day when you're the CEO of Dell, Michael Dell, and you come to work and you're told that protesters dressed in prison garb have showed up outside the door of your wife's upscale clothing boutique in Austin, Texas. And the reason that this happened was because the protesters were angry that Dell was using prisoners to disassemble and recycle its computers. And the ones that weren't being disassembled and recycled in prison were being sent over to Asia to be um, taken apart and recycled under obviously not safe conditions. And again, what happens to a computer after the consumer is done with it wouldn't normally be thought to be within the purview or responsibility of a company. But uh, Michael Dell responded at first by saying, okay, uh, if people want to bring their computers back to us and pay us a small fee, uh, we'll recycle them responsibly. We won't do it in prisons. Um, Ultimately, he, he uh, charged, first he charged, I think, $10, then it was $5, then he offered free recycling to not only anyone who bought a Dell computer, but anyone who bought any kind of a computer and was going to replace it with a Dell computer. So what's the lesson from these three stories? It's that no big company, no big consumer-oriented brand company can be successful for long today if it's perceived as being out of step with the needs, wants, and desires of its customers, of the larger community, of its employers. Or to put it in an even simpler way, um, if there's a problem out there of any kind, a company can't be seen as making that problem worse. You have to be seen as being part of the solution. And that may sound like being a big burden for business people who, after all, their primary job is to make products that people want and sell them at a profit. But in the case of all three of these companies, there turned out to be unexpected benefits from making these changes. Uh, Nike found that if it inspected its factories, if it did business predominantly with factory owners in China, Vietnam, or Indonesia who treated their employees decently, it turned out that those factories were actually more productive, more responsible, more able to meet their deadlines than the factories that abused or exploited their workers. Just like here in the United States, companies that treat their employees well tend to get better performance out of them than those that do not. And in the case of McDonald's, they found that offering healthier choices uh, attracted more women, particularly young mothers, into the stores and uh, expanded their business, uh, gave, built more of a bond of trust between the company and its consumers. And Dell found that free recycling was a benefit that enough people wanted that uh, it would create what they call stickiness, a longer relationship between them and their customers. So what began as threats in every instance turned out to be an opportunity, turned out to create business benefit by responding to those threats. The other thing I think we can see happening in these three stories is that expectations are rising of business. The social expectations, employee expectations, and customer expectations. Uh, companies are no longer simply responsible for the transaction that we have be between us and them. They're being asked to think about where their products come from, how they're consumed, and, and how they're used afterwards. Here are a few examples. Staples now takes great care to make sure that it buys wood products only from forests that are certified as being managed sustainably. Uh, earlier this week, I was at a Fortune conference talking to the CEO of Bumblebee Tuna. Uh, until very recently, they didn't pay much attention to where their tuna came from. 
Now, because the world's fisheries are being so poorly managed, largely because they cross over from one government to another, uh, Bumblebee, with a group of other companies that buys fish, has taken upon itself to make sure that it's only going to buy fish from, from uh, you know, suppliers and fisheries that are sustainably managed because they don't want to run out of fish. Um, Levi Strauss analyzed the life cycle of a pair of genes and found that a lot of the uh, climate and energy impact of the genes came when they're washed by the consumer. So they basically told their consumers, don't wash your jeans as often. You don't need to. Don't put them in the dryer after you wash them. And not only is that better for the planet, but they'll last longer as a result. Now, the message there is if you only have to wash your jeans four times a year, the jeans are going to last a lot longer than if you wash them you know, every week. Nike, uh, Levi's is going to sell fewer jeans. But nevertheless, that's the message that they're sending out. Um, similarly, Tide created a cold water version largely because they wanted to help their customers uh, save energy and do something for the climate. And Staples, uh, Staples, Starbucks has struggled at both ends of their supply chain to try to be more responsible. They're working very closely with coffee growers um, in tropical regions to make sure that the price that they're paying those growers is enough so that the growers, again, can use um, environmentally preferable methods of growing the coffee. And then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, they are working with the paper goods industry, their competitors, city and state officials to do something about the fact that today we still don't have a hot cup that's recyclable because those cups are not just made of cardboard. They're made of cardboard and plastic. And until we completely redesign them, there's no way they're going to be either compostable or recyclable. So from beginning to end, companies are taking a very expansive view of their role. And, and all of this comes under this big heading of the word sustainability, which I want to define for you here. Um, it's a simple but a very radical concept. Sustainability essentially means that we live our lives today in a way that does not compromise the ability of future generations to live. Um, simple but very, very hard to do. It essentially would mean using entirely renewable energy, because at some point we're going to run out of fossil fuels. It would mean a zero waste society, where at the end of life, everything we use is then made into something else. Um, so we're moving slowly in that direction, but I would say no individual company and certainly no society or country today is sustainability, or today is sustainable. Um, it's not a trend. Uh, it's not a fad. It's not going away. And that's because there are some big forces driving companies in that direction. Um, the first is the picture you see here. We live on a finite planet. Uh, Americans today consume. Uh, seven acres, the equivalent of seven acres of land for every American. Um, there's only four acres of arable land for every person on Earth, so that if all of the rest of the world want to live like we do here, and they do, they want to live in a more middle class, comfortable lifestyle, uh, this planet can't support it. That's why energy prices are rising and will continue to rise. That's why food and other commodity prices are rising and will continue to rise. That's why we need to make these kinds of radical changes, because the business as usual path um, leads in a very unhappy direction. But there is a whole set of other drivers as well, and I want to just take a minute to talk about those. The first and probably the number one driver is employees. Uh, it's a competitive world out there. Even in a tough economy, companies compete to attract the best talent. Hopefully, some of you in this room are that best talent. And to get folks like you, they want to be on the right side of these issues. People do not want to go to work just for a paycheck. They want meaning as well as money out of their work. 
And this is probably the number one reason why companies are changing to become more responsible and more sustainable. The second biggest reason is activist groups. Even very small groups, it, it's amazing, have the ability to move big companies. This, the poster comes from an organization called RAN, the Rainforest Action Network. They have about 20 or 30 employees in their office in San Francisco. Cargill, where this protest took place, is a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, they've also challenged Home Depot and, and others. And essentially by using creative tactics, by um, pushing at the company's brand and Home Depot, you know, they will basically, they've done things like go into a store and take over the microphone and say, you know, special in aisle eight, rare wood from the Indonesian rainforest. It's, the rainforest is disappearing even faster than the wood, rush over and get it now. Um, but their guerrilla tactics essentially have moved much bigger organizations to change. And the reason is not the tactics, it's because the issues they raise have real merit to them. A third driver is the internet and the idea of transparency. Um, I think small companies have always been responsible and sustainable, small town companies, because when they do something wrong, if they don't treat an employee right, or if you hear that the food, uh, my daughter worked in a diner in the town where, where I live in Bethesda, and when she came back and told me what the kitchen looked like, we decided not to eat at the diner anymore. Um, that world of knowing what's going on is happening in big business as well. There are no secrets. Um, we're living in a transparent world where information spreads extremely quickly, where you don't even need an organized group to, to talk about what's right or what's wrong with a company. Investors cut both ways. There are certainly investors whose only interest is what's happening in this next quarter, what's your stock price like in the next day or even hours. But an increasing number of investors are taking a longer view, particularly the socially responsible funds, and they are bringing pressure on companies uh, by meeting with CEOs, um, bringing shareholder resolutions at meetings to say, what are you doing about climate change? What are you doing about the content of your bottles, if you're Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. Um, what are you doing about other environmental and workplace issues ranging from, again, gay rights to, to the rights of people in the developing world? Government is not much of a factor here in the United States, but it's a big factor, particularly in the EU. And when they set rules about chemical content in computers or recycling of materials in carpets, uh, US companies, which are global companies, have to meet those higher standards. And of course, to some degree, and we'll talk about this in a minute, historically, government has been a huge driver of corporate responsibility. It's just not happening here today in the US. And finally, there are the customers. Uh, some customers today are conscious consumers. They want to buy from companies that stand for something. There aren't many of them. Um, they tend to affect companies at the margins. You know, the reason Nike reacted so swiftly in the 1990s was because young people and college students, once the word of the problems in their supply chain arose, said, I can buy my sneakers, I can buy my clothes from someone else. So at a company who has a reputational issue, the consumers can do some damage. At the other side of the spectrum, a company that's known for being a good company can begin to build a brand around that goodness with a small number of consumers. And here I'm thinking about the Stonyfield Farms and Ben and & Jerry's and Method and seventh generation and lots of other companies that have positioned themselves as green and are able to build their businesses and their brands by doing that. So the most influential companies in America, I would say there are three of them, and all three of them have really embraced this idea of sustainability in a big way. The first is GE. You've probably heard about their eco-imagination program. To some degree, it's a marketing campaign, but GE is selling lots of 
product that helps solve environmental problems. Uh, they're selling wind turbines. They're selling solar. They just announced this week that they've had a breakthrough in the efficiency of the solar panels they've been developing. They're selling efficient aircraft engines. They're selling efficient locomotives. Of course, they're selling the CFL light bulbs. And all of this has been good for their business. The revenues from this eco-imagination suite of products have grown more rapidly than the rest of the company. Um, they've followed up on eco-imagination uh, with another program called Health Imagination, which shows that it works if they're trying in a way to extend it to another part of their business. And the number one payback, I'm told, by their CEO, Jeff Immelt, is that people feel better about working for GE. He's able to attract better employees and able to keep his employees because they believe by working at GE, they're helping to solve these important problems. And he had a quote on this whole topic, which I think sums it up better than anything else I've heard. He said, if you want to be a great company today, you also have to be a good company. Another hugely influential company for a slightly different reason is Walmart. Um, GE's influence really is because they are thought of as the great trainer of managers. Walmart's influence is because if you're a consumer products company, you have to do business with Walmart. Um, they're just so much bigger than anyone else. Uh, they can have a huge impact on the consumer products industry. So Walmart, <laughs> back in 2006, embarked on a big sustainability effort. And by all accounts, it's, there's more enthusiasm inside the company today than there was when they got going. Um, they've saved a lot of money by doing things like, uh, you know, they used to have these big, they have a huge fleet. And they used to, on a cold day, the truckers would stop when they needed to take a break. And they'd just run the engine all night to keep the fleet or keep the truck cab warm enough so they could rest or sleep, all Walmart had to do was, at a relatively low cost, put in something called an auxiliary power unit in the cab. Now, instead of running the whole truck engine to stay warm, they run this little auxiliary power unit. They found the payback, the return on investment was really quick. And there are you know, dozens more examples like that inside Walmart. This is where the sustainability imperative and the business imperative align so well when it comes to saving resources, saving money. Um, another cool example, I thought, is Walmart used to pay to throw everything away, as, as most of us do. We pay through our taxes or we pay to the garbage company that takes it away. But they found out if they could separate things out, if they could separate you know, their cardboard, their bottles, their food waste, of which they have a lot, their plastics waste, their hangers. They apparently go through, you know, hundreds of millions of hangers over the course of a year. By taking those things, separating them, selling them to people who can recycle them and turn them into something else, Walmart took what was a cost of throwing trash in the landfill and actually their trash disposal or materials disposal, as they call it now, has become a revenue stream for them. So that's just an example of how we can begin to rethink the way we do business in this world in a way that makes both environmental sense and business sense. And I could talk about IBM, another hugely influential company. But I think instead, the third one I want to talk about is Google. So Google famously has this motto, uh, don't be evil. Uh, and it really does affect the way they do their business. I don't know how many of you paid attention to the story last year at this time, I guess it was, when uh, the Chinese government was continuing to censor Google. They felt that was not in accord with their values. And essentially what they did was pull most of their business out of China. They're still providing information on a, on a censored basis to Chinese people from Hong Kong, but they're no longer selling advertising or actually operating on any scale in China. And in the area, again, of energy and environment, uh, because they run so many data centers, because we are all powering so much more of our lives from what they call the cloud, um, they've been really aggressive around the area of renewable energy. Um, they've invested in a 
solar company, BrightSource. They've invested in a geothermal company, which isn't doing too well, called Alterock. Um, they've invested in a wind power company called Makani Power, which is trying to use kites to capture high altitude winds. Um, they're essentially taking the profits that they're making from their core business of selling advertising on the internet and saying, you know, we care enough, we know we depend long term on renewable energy to invest in a way to make renewable energy cheaper than coal. They have a whole initiative under that. But this is really, in a way, um, just part of the reason why uh, I have faith in business and capitalism's ability to solve our biggest problems. The, the title of the talk is Keeping the Faith in Capitalism. And, and before I make that larger point, I just want to briefly tell you a little about um, how I came to where I am now. So when I was your age, which was a long time ago, it was the late 1960s, um, a great time to be a college student, although we probably didn't spend quite as much time in the library as we should have. Um, but I was a typical 60s activist, rebel, liberal, um, protester, etc. And I got into journalism at the time of Woodward and Bernstein when, again, the Watergate era, this was kind of a heroic occupation. And then for about 25 or 30 years, uh, I got off track, as many people do. I started climbing the ladder. I moved from one newspaper to another. Um, and by the mid-1990s, I found myself uh, as an entertainment and media writer at Fortune magazine writing about the richest people in the world, you know, Rupert Murdoch and Michael Eisner at Disney. And uh, as someone later said to me, and this rang true, you know, I'd spent a long time climbing the ladder, and when I got near the top, I realized it was the wrong ladder. So round about 2000, um, I sort of said, what happened to that, you know, idealistic person uh, who got out of college almost 30 years ago? And I wrote a story for Fortune that tried to explore a set of issues around the relationship between faith and business. Uh, the story ran on the cover of Fortune, and it was called God and Business. You don't usually see the word God on the cover of a business magazine. I couldn't, 10 years ago, before the internet kept every cover, so I couldn't dig up a beautiful
house that was not gonna, um, you know, it, you know she, she comes from a family that uh, has a library at Yale named after her, so she probably never had one of those plastic Santa, Santa Clauses in her in her house. But I mean, I don't. I try not to be judgmental about that. I mean, I certainly don't think we should be a throwaway society, and I think we need to find a way to change behavior either through incentives or values so that people are much more conscious about what they buy. But if some people want to buy stuff that I wouldn't want to buy and throw it away a few months later because they make a judgment that, that it will give them some momentary pleasure, um, you know, it doesn't bother me, I guess, is what I'm saying. I think we need some systemic change to induce a cradle-to-cradle -cradle or no-waste society. But, um, you know, I don't want to be judgmental about the choices people make, I guess. Thank you. All right. Okay. So here's the but. There's no question, oops, I'm going to go back to here. So there's no question that capitalism needs limits, um, whether in the form of government regulation or self-imposed limits. Uh, and that's especially true around these environmental issues where we have what economists call externalities. That means problems that are costs that are generated by a business that are then shoved off to the rest of society. So water pollution is an externality, air pollution is an externality. Workers' health, before we had these rules around workplace safety, would be an externality. And um, greenhouse gas emissions is the giant mother of all externalities and the one which I think is going to be very, very hard for not only the world of business to solve, but also um, governments. The bad news is that it's not that we, not just that climate and energy policy in the US and in the world is failing, but we really don't have any kind of climate or energy policy in the world today. And I think there are reasons why it's going to be very hard to get there. So everything I've spoken about so far, Walmart and GE and Google's research and Silicon Valley investing in wind and solar, um, you know, the Prius, the recycling bin under your desk, all of that um, has not made enough of a difference in dealing with this climate change problem. Our emissions of greenhouse gases uh, have grown every single year since 1990, except for one, 2009, and that was because of the deep global recession. I promise there are only two charts in this presentation. That's the first one. The orange line is the atmospheric concentration of CO2, and the blue line is the uh, annual emissions. So you can see over a long period of time, those annual emissions have gone up dramatically. That's what they call the hockey stick graph. But even here, since we became more conscious of the problem, this is since 1960, you can see even since 1990, we haven't changed the trajectory. They're growing pretty much at the same rate in the last 20 years as they did in the 30 years before that. Uh, and this uh, isn't, unfortunately, an accident. I, I think climate change is perhaps the most difficult problem the world has ever had to solve. And, and if someone wants to challenge that in the questions, I would love, I'd love to be challenged on that. But I think it is literally the most difficult problem the world has ever had to solve. So here's why. First of all, we're dealing with CO2, that's the pollutant, quote unquote, that causes climate change. And it's a colorless, odorless gas that's all around us. Very hard to get people, we're literal-minded people, very hard to get people worried or excited about something they can't 
see, feel, touch, taste, or smell. The reason the environmental movement started in the United States back in the 60s and 70s was because you could go to Los Angeles and see smog. Uh, there was a famous moment in the late 60s when the river uh, outside of Cleveland, the Cuyahoga River, actually caught on fire. There were so many chemicals being dumped into the river. Uh, this is different. It's different. The other difference is that the previous pollution problems that we've solved have been local problems. You know, in China, there's an environmental movement growing now because, again, they can see the smog. They can see the air is bad. They can see the water coming out of their tap is bad. Uh, climate change is entirely a global problem. Um, it's one atmosphere. The emissions from my car in Bethesda have exactly the same amount of effect on the atmosphere as a coal plant in China or um, tearing down a forest in Indonesia. So that means everyone has to get involved in this if it's going to work. Literally, at least the major economies of the world have to get involved. The other reason it's difficult is that the costs of solving the problem are local and today. I mean, we kind of know what to do. You can put solar panels on your house. Your utility company can erect a wind turbine, but that will be a local cost. The government could put a tax on gasoline, but we'd all pay that tax today. And the benefits are global and in the distance. That's a very tough, both personal action kind of to take. You're doing something now that may be inconvenient or more expensive. The benefits are a long way off, and they're diffuse. And it's a very tough problem for the political system to solve. And finally, this question of international cooperation. This is what these uh, Copenhagen and Cancun and Kyoto and UN meetings are about. It's not just that everybody has to join in. We sort of have to figure out who does what. So the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases today in the world is now China, because they're such a big country. The US is number two. However, CO2 persists in the environment for a very long time, up to 100 years. So most of the CO2 in the environment today comes from the US and Europe, the developed world, because we've been burning coal and driving cars in large numbers for decades. So the question is, whose responsibility is it to solve this problem? Is it the people who are emitting today? Is it the historical emitters? Uh, there's programs now where Western countries are sending money to the developing world to help them build wind and solar and other forms of clean energy. But politically, it's very difficult to justify sending US money to China, for example, when China is now the world's number one polluter. And remember, they have a huge and emerging middle class. An economist at Columbia University, Scott Barrett, talks about the issue this way. He called it a colossal collective action problem. It always was in theory. Now, after 20 years of action, we've seen it in practice. So we knew in 1990 that the problem had the dimensions that I just outlined. We've been working on it, or governments have been working on it since then, and essentially have made no meaningful progress. No meaningful progress. So what does climate science tell us about business as usual uh, 10 years hence, uh, the science is uncertain, but it points in some pretty clear directions. Temperatures will rise, another problem uh, that we're talking, that has, doesn't get enough as much attention, but significant, called the acidification of the oceans, which is the oceans are absorbing a lot of the CO2, is killing lots of coral and messing with the food chain. Um, eventually, if you kill coral and little fish, the big fish that need those things to feed on um, are going to struggle. Uh, those are the gradual changes. I think we probably can figure out a way to adapt to those things if they happen slowly. What really worries the scientists is the 
slim but real possibility of rapid, unexpected changes. So there's talk about what could happen if the Arctic began to melt quickly, what that would do to sea level rises, and that it would release lots of methane. I'm not going to explain how that works because I'm not a climate scientist, but there are climate tipping points that if we cross them, it will be uh, not gradual change, but big changes could happen in a relatively short period of time. We should be worried about these more than we are worried about them as a society. So I'm getting near the end. There are three. There's not really a lot of mystery about how to solve this problem. We know what we should do. There are really only three approaches to this climate threat. One is mitigation. That means stop pouring CO2 into the air. That, as I've just explained, is really, really hard to do because energy uh, is the driver of economic growth. And um, we've just struggled to make those changes. We've struggled to spend that money. The second strategy is called adaptation. That means we assume it's coming. We know it's coming. It's coming slowly, so we adapt to it. When we rebuild a highway along the coast, we build it a few feet higher. When we plan agriculture, we know that things are more likely to be growing in the colder parts of Canada in the future than the places that, where there's a lot of drought today. Adaptation is difficult. It's expensive. But as long as we continue to generate war wealth in the world, um, human beings are a pretty adaptable species. We live on the equator. We live near the poles. Um, nature will not adapt well to this, but, but we should be able to adapt. The third strategy is something that I'm personally very interested in. We can get into in the questions, which is this idea of geoengineering. That means trying to mess with the planet's climate on a global scale using technology of one kind or another to do something about climate change. Some of the ideas under the geoengineering heading are a little crazy. You know, there's talk about uh, changing the orbit of the moon so it blocks more of the sun by sending you know, nuclear weapons up to the moon and blowing up parts of it. There's talk about putting mirrors, little tiny mirrors, up into space to reflect sunlight. Um, there's lots of techniques that scientists are talking about, some of them more promising than others. What we're really talking about here, though, is changing our time scale, changing the frame in which we think. And this, again, is why it's a hard problem. We need to think about it. It's a moral question here. It really has to do with taking moral responsibility for future generations. And politicians, unfortunately, are very, very bad at that. They tend to be elected every two, four, or six years, so it's hard for them to think five, 10, 20 years down the line rather than 100 years down the line. And business is also not very good at that. Um, at worst, they're quarter to quarter. The best businesses maybe think longer term than that. I think the reason why Bumblebee worries about the oceans is because they're thinking we want to be in business 20, 40, 60 years from now. Um, but again, very hard to get business to think on that long time scale. But there actually are a couple of institutions in society that are good at thinking on a long time scale. So you recognize that image, I'm sure. Um, religion has been around for a long time, longer than just about anything else made by people. The Judeo-Christian Islamic religions are literally thousands of years old. And so to me, when I say keeping the faith in capitalism, I, I mean it both in the sense of having faith, but I mean also keeping the idea of faith in the world of markets. And it's not a radical idea. Uh, Adam Smith, uh, you know, who wrote The Wealth of Nations famously, he was really the first economist. But since he was the first one, he couldn't study economics. He actually was also a moral philosopher. And the other book that he wrote was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And 
while the wealth of nations is about how self-interest eventually is good for everybody, the mo theory of moral sentiments is about empathy. It's about compassion, and he tried to understand in that book why, if we're self-interested, we can also be interested in the well-being of others. And he always believed in a form of capitalism, a form of economics that had both this element of compassion and this element of self-interest together. And when I've looked back and tried to think about the closest thing to a movement uh, that would be the equivalent of the movement we're going to need to deal with the climate issue, uh, I went back and read a book called Bury the Chains by Adam Hochschild, which was about the global anti-slavery movement. Uh, interestingly, a religious-based movement, the global economy was as dependent on slavery in the 18th and first half of the 19th centuries as we are today, dependent on fossil fuels. And there w it was really the first actual sort of civil society movement of any kind. It was the model for the environmental movement, the women's movement, and everything else that followed. And a small group of people, mostly motivi motivated by religion and appealing to uh, the broader society's sense of right and wrong, in a pretty short period of time, really from the the very end of the 1800s to, or rather the very end of the 1700s to the middle of the 1800s, pretty much wiped slavery for the most part off the face of the earth. And that's about the amount of time we have now, 50 years. And I do see stirrings of a religious climate movement forming. We call for a civil dialogue and prudent and constructive action to protect God's precious gift of the Earth's atmosphere with a sense of genuine solidarity and justice for all God's children. That's the Catholic bishops. I could have found a similar quote from the evangelicals, from the Jews. The challenge is really to get those words heard more widely in the world. So, as I said, we know what to do. We know what to do personally. We need to consume less. We need to be more responsible about what we consume. We need to be aware of our own personal impacts on the planet. And we pretty much know what to do politically. We need to capture the externality of carbon emissions. And how you do that is up for debate. But essentially, you just want to capture that price somehow. You want to recognize that there's a limited amount of space up there in the atmosphere. And anyone, individual or company, who wants to use some of that space by emitting carbon will have to pay a price for it. And eventually, that will drive usage away from fossil fuels and towards clean energy. Um, it's just a question of how we collectively figure out how to do what we know we should do.
turning it again into a bipartisan issue is both business and the religious communities trying to reach out to those Republicans so that we can once again have sort of moderate or green Republicans in the conversation and hopefully get something done. Um, certainly the evangelical churches tend to have a very conservative political membership and there is a lively, um, I forget the name of it, creation care I think is the word they use in the evangelical movement when they talk about environmental and climate issues. So hopefully they can build some bridges there. Please. I'm Liz, I'm in the Masters of Nonprofit Administration program. I work in town um, for the Salvation Army. We're in the middle of building a big, huge, amazing new facility. And I was just questioning my boss about if we might ever have the chance to have sustainably harvested food in our huge kitchen that we're going to serve for all of the people in need in our community. Um, and he says, well, as long as GFS um, starts to do sustainable food or wherever it's cheapest, um, I, I guess I hope to hear, I, I'm asking for more hope from you. I want to hear more from that first half of the presentation on what trust do you have that capitalism will um, trickle down into, I just see this swarms of people in need who, number one, they, they care about having food on the table in front of them and their lights on, um, let alone the third world, they care about that most. How is capitalism um, and faith, how is that ever going to tie in enough to get those in need to care about the environment above their own subsistence? And, and, and how is that ever gonna tie in together? And why is capitalism going to be able to help with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's really hard. You know, it's really hard for people who don't aren't getting their basic needs met to worry about the fate of the planet fifty or seventy-five years from now. I think it's unrealistic. Um, so, I think on, it's it's a two-step process in a sense. I mean, developed societies start to care about things other than getting food on the table when they have food on the table. Um, you know, the environmental movement is a product of, ten, of societies that tend to be wealthy. So we have to, we need to continue to generate wealth and economic growth. And, um, you know, I, I know we're in a hurry, unfortunately, on the climate issue, but I don't, I think it's unre very hard to ask someone who's poor to worry about this issue. That's why it's hard to ask China and India to to build wind turbines rather than coal plants because wind turbines unfortunately still cost more than coal plants. Um, in the food area, there's actually a lot of good things going on, having said that. I mean, big companies like McDonald's are looking at their supply chains and trying to measure carbon. So is PepsiCo. You know, they want to figure out, they want to basically buy oranges for Tropicana from farmers who are more responsible in the way they deal with fertilizer and emissions and things like that. So the food system, assuming we're science-based about it, assuming we don't think we don't pretend that we can feed the world with local and organic food, um, it, it, there's a lot of good encouraging changes going on there. But you know, when you're poor, you can't, it, I, I, you know, That's why we all need, that's why we need economic growth and more wealth and more education and all that good stuff to deal with this problem as well. Hi, Mark. I'm Ed Cohen. I'm in communications here with the Mendoza College. Um, you talk about being a storyteller, and I thought it was very interesting in your talk uh, comparing the situation with climate change or movement for climate change with what happened with the, the movement to abolish slavery. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell a story. Uh, about kind of tying us all together, how this might come about, how <laughs> religious institutions might organize to oppose this, and then eventually it's going to have to end up, the government has to abolish slavery, not the churches or the synagogues. I wonder if you could tell a story about how this might come about and maybe even put it in a time frame. <laughs> Whoa! No, I don't think I can do that. Um, 
yeah, you know, actually, I do spend a little bit of time talking to people who think about how best to communicate on this issue of climate, because it does seem that scare and gloom and doom, they seem to tell me, isn't really a good motivator. Um, so I, I agree we need to, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a narrative or a story that would, you know, again, with slavery, you had literally had people in chains. You could take a, you could, there wasn't the internet, obviously. And I don't think there was even really photography in the, in the late 1800s, but you could draw pictures. Maybe there was a little bit of photography. There were, yeah, but this was before the Civil War. This was the 1790s or 80s when it started. But, um, you know, it's very tangible. It's very human. There were people suffering today. There are probably people suffering today because of climate change, you know, the drought in Australia and the floods in Pakistan and things. But the, the system scientifically is so complicated that you can't really tie climate to a particular severe weather event. Um, I mean, I guess the most... I guess the thing I would say is that, to a degree, Americans are not great at thinking about the future. I mean, there was no save. It was a negative. People didn't save any money in this country for a period of time in the early 2000s. They just kept borrowing more out of their houses so they could spend. But with the exception of that period of time, you know, most Americans, anyway, are, they understand you can save to buy your first house. They understand you can save to put your kids through college or save for your retirement. And that means giving up something today for the future. And that's all we're really talking about here. We're talking about making some reasonably small sacrifices in terms of cost and convenience today so that our children or grandchildren continue to, can continue to enjoy the good life we have now. I don't think that's too much to ask of people. Yeah. Oh, time for one more. And you can all go to lunch. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question a little bit um, on the... Speak the up a little so the folks can oh, hear you. Okay, so I wanted to ask a question a little bit on um, kind of the point you were making about how the global climate change is the world's greatest problem. Um, I actually think that it's probably true, but I know a lot of people who don't. And when I, so when, I, when I'm talking to them about them, I, always, I find myself getting stuck more often than not, or I feel like I should have greater... A, a, a stronger argument to convince them that it, that it is reality, because um, you mentioned how uh, when when climate change became big in the media, it was also popular to express the the minority opinion that it's not a big deal. So I want to know what you um, what kind of approach you take if you're trying to convince somebody that it's something that really should be considered, because then I feel like we can begin to take real proactive steps. Right, and neither you nor I. Uh, you know, are going to sit and read the thousand-page reports of the international, the IPCC, I don't even know what IPC stands for, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is many thousands of scientists put those reports together. I mean, I guess I, I usually, it depends who I'm talking to, but I usually say two things. One is that really smart business people I know who have taken the time to look at this have decided that it's important enough to change the way they do business. So that's why I mentioned GE or Walmart. I mean, the head of Walmart, Lee Scott, you know, went to New Hampshire and talked to people who uh, do maple syrup up there. And they basically told him, you know, we see it in the maple syrup. The trees don't produce it at the same time of year as they used to because it's getting warmer here all the time. So sometimes I sort of cite business authority. And, you know, Jeff Immelt, who runs GE, is a Republican. He's you know, by his own description. Um, but he's a realist, and he has scientists who work for him, and they've told him this is a big business opportunity. See, he's, he's betting his business that sometime we're going to put a price on carbon to pay for those efficient engines and locomotives and light bulbs and everything else. And sim lots of companies are doing that because they really do believe it's not only a threat but a real opportunity. So that's one. And the other thing I say is, you know, and this has nothing to do with President Obama or, or George Bush or anything else, but there is, 
the US did do a big report, the government, on climate change impacts. And essentially, it says, here, here they are. And I don't remember the URL on the internet, but it was, here are like places in the United States that are already feeling the impacts of climate change. And again, we're at a very early stage here. The, the chart, we're in the f high 380, 390 range. And that's the, again, this is really boring stuff. It's hard to talk about it excitingly, but it's like parts per million. So it's a very small amount, you know, 380, 390 parts per million in the atmosphere of CO2. We were at 280 before the Industrial Revolution. Some people say we need to get back to 350. Some people say we're OK at 450. But the point is we're moving very steadily and rapidly to a point where most scientists say we're, we're, we're putting ourselves at risk. I mean, it's sort of like insurance, right? What's the chance of your house burning down? Pretty slim. What's the chance of even your car getting in an accident? Maybe higher for you than me, but still pretty slim. But we have auto insurance for that. We have homeowner's insurance for the house. We ought to spend a little bit of money to do kind of planetary insurance to make sure that um, we don't mess this up any more than we have. So OK. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Marcus. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you.